Welcome back to theCUBE's ongoing coverage of VMworld 2021, the second year in a row we've done this virtually. My name is Dave Vellante, and longtime VMware technologist and new CTO, Kit Colbert is here. Kit, welcome, good to see you again. Thanks Dave, super excited to be here. So let's talk about your new role. You, you've been at VMware, you've, you've touched all the bases, so to speak, <laughs> and uh, you know, love the career evolution. You, you, you're ready for this job. So tell us about that role. Well, yeah, I hope so. I don't know. It's uh, definitely a big step up. Uh, been here at VMware for 18 years now, which if you know Silicon Valley, you know that's a long time. It's probably like four or five normal Silicon Valley lifetime uh, in terms of stints at a company. But I love it. I, I love the the company. I love the culture. I love the technology. Um, and I'm, I'm super passionate, super excited about it. And so, you know, the, the new role, previously I, I was CTO for one of our business groups and focused on a specific uh, set of our products and services. But now as the corporate CTO, I really am overseeing, you know, all of VMware R&D uh, in the sense of really trying to drive a whole bunch of core uh, engineering transformations, right? Where we've talked a lot about our shift toward becoming um, a SaaS company, so, you know, cloud services company. And so there's a lot of changes we got to make internally, technologies, uh, platform services we need to build out, uh, you know, the, the sort of culture aspects of it again. And, and so, you know, I'm kind of sitting at the center of that and it's, I'll be honest, it's big. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff to go and do, uh, but I am just, you know, super excited about it. Wake up every day. I'm uh, really excited to meet a whole bunch of new people across the organization and to learn all the cool things we're doing. It's just, the, you know, I'll say it again, like the level of innovation happening inside VMware is just insane. And it's really cool now that I get kind of more of a, a front and center road to see everything that's happening. Well, and, and when I was preparing for uh, the interview with Raghu, I was thinking about, you know, I've been following VMware for a long time. And, yeah. and, I, and I sort of noted that it's like the fourth you know, wave of, yeah. of executive management. I sort of went back and said, okay, yes, we know it started with, you know, workstation, okay, fine. But then really quickly went into really changing the way in which we think about servers and server utilization and, and, and driving. I remember the first time I ever saw a demo, I said, wow, this is going to be completely game changing. And really, yeah. and, then, and then thought about the era of the software defined data center, fine tuning the cloud strategy, and then this explosion of innovation, whether it was this sort of NS, NSX piece, the acquisitions you've made uh, around security, uh, you know, again, mm -hmm. more cloud expansion. And now you know, you're laying out sort of this Switzerland from multi-cloud combined with uh, this, as you're pointing out, this as a service model. Yep. So when you think about the technical vision of the company transforming into a cloud and subscription model. What does that mean from a sort of architectural standpoint or yeah. a mindset perspective? Oh uh, yeah, both great questions and both sort of key focus areas for me. And by the way, it's something I've been thinking about for quite a while, right? Um, yeah, so you're right. Like we are on our third or fourth uh, lap of the track, depending on, on um, how you count. But I also think that this one, that this notion of getting into multi-cloud, of becoming a real cloud services company is going to be uh, probably the, the biggest one for us and the biggest transformation that we're going to have to make. You know, we, we did extend from core compute virtualization to network and storage with the software defined data center. But now these things I think are a bit more fundamental. So, you know, how are we thinking about it? Well, we're thinking about it in a few different ways. I do think, as you mentioned, the mindset is definitely the most important thing. This notion that um, it, you know we no longer really have product teams purely; they, they should be thinking of themselves as service teams. And the idea being that they are operating and accountable for the availability of their cloud service. And so this means uh, we really need to step up our game. We have in terms of the types of tooling that we built, but really it's about getting these developers uh, engaged with that to know that hey, like what matters most of all right now is that service availability. In, in addition to things like security compliance, etc. But we have monitoring systems to tell you, hey, like there's a problem and that you need to go jump on those things immediately. This is not like, you know, normal bug that comes in, oh, I'll get to it tomorrow or whatever. It's like, no, no, you got to step up and really get there immediately. And so there is that big mindset shift and that's something we've been driving for the past few years, but we need to continue uh, to push there. And as part of that, you know, the other thing we're doing is that what we've seen is that a lot of our individual teams have gone out and build like really great cloud services. 
But what we really want to build uh, to enable us to accelerate that is a platform, a true you know, SaaS platform and leveraging all these great capabilities that we have to help all of our teams go faster. And so it gets to things like standardization and uh, really raising the bar across the board to allow all these teams to focus on what makes their products or services unique and differentiated rather than you know just doing the basic blocking and tackling so those are a couple of things i'm really focused on uh, both driving the mindset shift you know i think when i you know as i was taking on this role i did a lot of reading uh, on other ctos and you know how do they view their roles within their companies and one of the things i did here there was that the cto is kind of the the, I don't know if the, the keeper is the right word, but the keeper of the engineering culture, right? That you want to really be a steward for that and to help take it forward in the right sort of directions that align with the, the strategic direction of the business. And so that's a big aspect for what I'm thinking about. And the second one, the SaaS platform, one of the really interesting things about uh, this reorg that we've done internally is that traditionally CTO is kind of focused, you know, outbound, maybe a little bit inbound, um, but typically, don't have large engineering organizations. But here, what we want to do, because this, this SaaS platform is so important to us, we did centralize it within the office of the CTO. And so now, you know, my customers from an engineering standpoint are all the internal business units. So a lot of really big changes inside VMware, but I think this is the sort of stuff we need to do to help us really accelerate toward the multi-cloud vision that we're painting. Well, VMware's always had a super strong engineering culture. And I like the way you phrase that, the steward of, of the engineering culture. And when you think about a product mindset, when, I, to, 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 of course, correct me if I'm off here, but when you're building a product and you're making that thing rock solid, you know, Maurice used to talk about the hardened top. And, and, and so I, it seems to me that the services mindset expands the, the mind a little bit in terms of what other services can I integrate to make my, my, my service better to whether that's a machine intelligence service or a security mm -hmm. service or you know the dozens of other services that you guys are now building the combination of that yep. innovation is has like a step function and a lever on top of the sort of traditional product mindset yeah there's i think you're absolutely right there's a ton of like really fundamental uh mental <laughs> mindset shifts right that, that are a part of that and the integration piece you mentioned is super critical, but I also think it's it's actually taking a step back and looking at the life cycle more holistically. Uh, when you're thinking about a product, you're thinking about, okay, I'm gonna get the bits together, I'm gonna ship it out, but then it's really up to the customer to go deploy that, to operate it, to you know, deal with problems and bugs that come up. And when you're delivering a cloud service, those are all problems that you as the application creator have to deal with. And so you gotta be on top of all those things. And you know, if you uh, design something in such a way that it becomes kind of hard to debug at runtime, well, that's going to directly impact your availability. That might have, you know, contractual obligations with an SLA uh, impact to a customer. So there's some really big implications there that I think traditionally product teams didn't always fully think through, but now they, they sort of have to with uh, a cloud service. The other point I think that's really important there is the notion of simplicity and ease of use. Experience is always important, right? Customer experience, user experience, but it gets e even more magnified in a SaaS type of environment because the idea is that you shouldn't have to talk to anybody. You as a user should be able to go and call an API and start using this thing, right? And swipe a credit card and you're good to go. And so, you know, that sort of maniacal focus on how you just remove roadblocks, remove any unnecessary things between that customer and getting the value that they're looking for. So in general, the thing that I really love about SaaS and cloud services is that they really align incentives very well. What you want to do as an application builder, uh, as a solution builder, really aligns well with what customers are looking for. And you can get that feedback very, very rapidly, which allows for much quicker evolution of the underlying uh, product and application. So one of the other things I, I learned from my interview with Raghu, and I couldn't go deep into it. I did, did a little bit with Submit, but I wonder if I get your perspectives as well. Is I, I always talk about this abstraction layer across clouds, hybrid, multi-clouds, <laughs> edge. Extract, abstracting the complexity of the, you know, the underlying complexity. And, yep. and Raghu was sort of, it's nuanced, but he said, okay, but, but the thing is, we're not trying to limit access to the primitives. We, yeah. wanna, we wanna allow developers to go there to the extent they want to. And my takeaway was, okay, the, but the, the abstraction is you want to be that single management layer with access to the deep primitives and APIs of the respective clouds 
Uh, mm -hmm. but, 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 but simplify, to your point, across those estates at yep. the management layer. Maybe you could add yep. some color to that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a really interesting question. And, um, uh, but let me tell you about how we think about it because you're right. And that, uh, you know, the abstractions can sometimes hide the underlying primitives and capabilities. And so Ragu is getting at, hey, like, we don't necessarily force you one way or the other. And here's the way to think about it. It's that it's really about delivering optionality. And we do that through offering these abstractions at different layers. So to your point, Dave, like we have uh, management capabilities that can enable you to manage consistently across all types of clouds, public, uh, private, edge, et cetera, irrespective of what that underlying infrastructure is. And so you look at things there like our vRealize suite of products or cloud health or Tanzu, Tanzu Mission Control <laughs> is, is really focused on that one as well. Um, but then we also have our infrastructure layer. That's what we're doing with VMware Cloud and this notion of delivering consistent infrastructure. Now, even though, even though the, the, the core sort of IaaS layer is more consistent, you still get great flexibility in terms of the higher level services. If you want to use a database uh, from one of the public clouds or a messaging system or streaming service, or, you know, AI, whatever it is, you still get that sort of optionality as well. And so the reason that we offer these different things is because customers are just in different places. And as a matter of fact, a single customer may have all of those different use cases, right? They may have some apps where they're moving from on-prem into the cloud. They want to do that very quickly. So boom, we can just do it really fast with VMware Cloud, consistent infrastructure. We can vMotion that thing up to the cloud, great. But for other ones, there may be a modern app they're building and maybe a team has chosen to use native AWS for that, but they want to leverage Kubernetes. So there you could put in a, a Tanzu mission control uh, to give them that you know, consistent management across sites uh, or leverage cloud health to understand uh, costs and to really enable the application teams to manage costs on their own. So I, I think, you know, I always go back to that, that concept of optionality. Like we, we offer sort of these different levels of abstraction and it really depends on what the use case is because the reality is, especially for a complex enterprise, they're likely going to have all those use cases. You know, I, I want to stay on optionality for a moment because you're essentially becoming a, a, a cloud company, I'm, I'm, I'm expanding the definition of cloud, and that's which I think is appropriate because the cloud is expanding. It's going on-prem, it's going out to the edge, hybrid connections across clouds, et cetera. And, and, but when you look at the public cloud players, they're, they all are deep into what I'll call data management. I'm not even sure what that term means anymore sometimes, but, but certainly they all own, own databases, uh, that, but they also offer databases from, from folks. You, I go back to something Moritz said with the software mainframe, the, the, we want to be able to run any workload, you know, anywhere uh, and, and have high reliability, recovery, you know, low co lowest cost, et cetera. It doesn't seem as though, so you're going you're gonna to run those, those workloads. Project Monterey is about supporting new workloads, but it doesn't seem like you have aspirations to, to, to own sort of the database layer, for example. What's your philosophy around that? Yeah, not generally. I mean, we, we do have um, some solutions like Greenplum, for instance, uh, that, that play in that space, more of a data warehouse solution. Right. But generally speaking, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, VMware success was built uh, through tight partnerships. We have a very, very broad partner network. And of course we see hyperscalers as uh, great partners as well. And so, you know, I think if we get back to like, what's the core of VMware, it really is providing those powerful abstractions in the right places at the infrastructure level, at the management level and so forth. Uh, but we're, yeah, we're not trying to necessarily compete with everyone, reinvent the world. What we're trying to do is, and, and by the way, if I just take a step back, when we talk to customers, what really drives them toward multi-clouds, toward using multiple clouds, is the fact that they want to get after these, what we call best of breed cloud services. That many of the different public clouds offer databases and AI and ML systems. And for each app team, the exact one that perfectly meets their needs may be different, right? Maybe on one cloud versus another cloud. And so that is really the optionality that, that we want to optimize for when we talk to those customers, that we, they want the easiest way of getting that app onto that cloud so we can take advantage of that cloud service. But what they worry about is the lack of consistency there. And that goes across the board. You know, if something fails at 2 a.m., you have to wake up and go fix it, 
do you have like the right sort of tooling in place if it's fails on one cloud versus another do you have to like you know scramble to figure out which tools to go use how to go you know which dashboard to look at it's like no you want kind of a consistent one when you think about uh, from a security perspective, how do you drive a secure software supply chain? How do you prevent the types of uh, attacks that we've seen in the past few years where people insert malicious code into your supply chain? And now you're running with hacked code out there. And if you have different teams doing different things across different clouds, well, that's going to just open up sort of a can of worm of um, of different possibilities there for hackers to get in. So that's why this consistency is so important. And so, you know, if I guess, you know, if we refine the optionality a little bit, that point, it's about getting optionality around cloud services. And, and then those like, those are the things that really differentiate. And so that, you know, we're not trying to compete with that. We're saying, hey, like we want to bring customers to those and give them the best experience that they can, irrespective of whether that's in the public cloud or on-prem or even at the edge. And that's a huge technical challenge and amazing value for customers. Uh, I want to ask you, there's a lot of talk about ESG today. Mm -hmm. How does that fit into the CTO mindset? Yeah. Is it a bolt on? Is it, is it a fundamental component? Yeah, the, the idea there is that if we look at the, the core values for VMware, this is something that's hugely important. Um, and it's something that we've actually been focused on for quite a while. We now have a whole team uh, focused on this, really being a force multiplier to help keep us honest across VMware, to help uh, ensure equity in, in many different ways that we have uh, and are continuing to increase, for instance, uh, the amount of female representation within our organization or underrepresented minorities or communities, uh, ensuring that you know pay is, is equal across uh, the company, you know, th these different sorts of things, but also around sustainability. They actually have a number of folks working very closely with our teams to drive uh, sustainability into our products. You know, vSphere is great because it uh, reduces the amount of physical service you need. So by definition, reduces the carbon footprint there. But now we're you know, taking a step further. Um, we have uh, cloud partners uh, that we're working with to ensure that they have net zero carbon emissions, you know, using 100% renewables uh, by 2030. And in fact, that's something that we ourselves have signed up for is, you know, today we are carbon neutral, um, but what we want to get to is to be net carbon zero by 2030, which is an absolutely huge lift. And that's by the way, not just for VMware, our operations, our offices, but also for uh, our supply chain as well. And so, you know, when you look across this, um, you know, as well as efforts around diversity and inclusion, this is something that is very core uh, to what we do as a company, but it's also a personal passion of mine. Um, the ESG office actually lives within uh, my organization. And it does that because what I view the office of the CTO as being is really a, a force multiplier, as I said before, like, yes, the uh, team is located here, but their purview is across all of engineering and in fact, all of VMware. So I think, you know, when we look at this, it's about um, getting the best talent we have, very diverse talent, increasing our ability to deliver innovative products, but also doing so in a way that's good for the planet, that is sustainable, and that is giving back to the community. But I, I think, you know, I, I'm looking at measuring success in a few different ways. Um, first of all, uh, as I said before, the ESG component and, and diversity, uh, equity, inclusion in particular, in terms of our workforce, extraordinarily important to me and something we're, we're going to be really pushing hard on. You know, as we all know, um, you know, women, underrepresented minorities, uh, not very well represented in general in Silicon Valley. So something that we all need to step up on. And so we're going to be putting a lot of effort in there. And that will actually help drive, as I said before, all these innovations, this fundamental shift in mindset. I mean, that requires diverse perspectives. It requires pushing us out of our comfort zone. But the net result of that is that what you're going to see is a much faster cadence of releases of innovation coming from VMware. So there's some just insanely exciting things <laughs> that are happening in the labs right now that we're cooking up. But you know, as we start making this shift, we're going to be delivering those faster and faster to our customers and our partners. You know, it's, I'm interested to hear that it's a passion of yours. There was an article, of, I think it was last week in the Wall Street Journal. It was, a, it was an insert section on, on women in the workforce. And mm -hmm. there was a stat in there, which I thought was pretty interesting. I'll run it by you, see what you think. It said that, you know, it's, it's talking about COVID and, and post COVID and the stresses. And, and it's interesting to me because a lot of executives are, and, and you know, I'm, I'm with them is, hey, work from home. This is a, 
It's a beautiful thing. It's good mm -hmm. for business too, because you know everybody's you know, more productive. But there's you have this perpetual workday now. It's like we never yeah. we never sleep. Yeah. It goes it bleeds in the yep. weekends. And the stat yep. from Qualtrics, which was published in the journal, said that I think it said 30% of working women said that they, their mental health has declined since COVID. Mm -hmm. And that number was only 15% for working men. It's still still notable, but half. And so you know one has to question maybe that perpetual work week. And, and you know, maybe there's a benefit from business productivity, but then there's the other side of that as, as well. And, and a lot of women have left the workforce, a lot of working, uh, previously working moms. And so there's, a, there's an untapped labor pool there and there's this huge labor shortage. And so these are important issues, but they're not easy ones to solve, are they? No, no, no. It's something we've been putting a lot of thought into uh, at VMware. So we do have a, a flexible uh, program that we're rolling out in terms of work. Uh, people can come into the office if they want to. Of course, you know where we have offices where it's safe to do so, where the the government has allowed that. Um, uh, or people can and people can have an, an actual desk there. Or sometimes they could say, "Hey, I only want to come in once or twice a week." And then we say, "Okay, we'll have some floating desks that you can take." And others are saying, "I want to be fully remote." So we give people a, a pretty broad range in terms of how they want to address that. But I do think, to your point, though, and this is something I've been really trying to do already is to create a more inclusive environment uh, by doing a number of different things. And so it's being thoughtful around when you're sending emails. Cause like I do like the, my sort of schedule is I, I do tend to like fire off a lot of emails late at night after the kids are in bed, I get a little quiet time, <clears throat> some thinking time, but I make it very clear that I'm not expecting an immediate response. Don't worry about it. I'm just, this is my work time. It doesn't have to be your work time. And so really setting those, um, I guess boundaries, if you will, explicitly and kind of uh, the, the expectations, maybe it's a better term, setting that explicitly, trying to schedule meetings, um, not at times where you're going to have to drop the kids off at uh, school or pick them up. It's your right hand to take over your life. And so we really try to emphasize boundaries and, and really setting those things appropriately. But honestly, it's something that we're still working on and I'm still learning. And so I'd love to get feedback from folks, but those are some of the early thinkings. But I would say that we at VMware are taking it very, very seriously and um, really supporting our employees in terms of navigating that work-life balance. Well, okay, congratulations on the new role and uh, it's great to see you again. I hope, I hope next year we can be face-to-face. -face. Uh, always a yeah. pleasure to have you on theCUBE. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it being here. All right, and thank you for watching theCUBE's continuous coverage of VMworld 2021, the virtual edition. Keep it right there for more right after this.